Hello, and welcome to week two, day two of distance learning. Um, we're pretty much going to follow the exact same process that we followed last week, in that as we read the text today, we're going to annotate the text, which means to underline, circle, and write in the margin. Um, after we do that, we're going to answer questions. Um, what I'm going to do is, before we start, I'm going to read all the directions to you, then I'm going to break it down and tell you what we're going to do, and then we're going to read the text, okay? Uh, let's go ahead and let's jump into it. Let me take my face off. And here we go. Day two, reading closely by annotating the text. Objective, today you will reread and annotate the text titled Human Changes to the Environment in the Missing Links. Directions, reread Human Changes to the Environment in the Missing Links. Use the annotation key below to mark up each text. During read, be sure to look for evidence that supports you in answering the questions you created on day one. Look for evidence in each text that will help you answer the focus question for the week. Focus question. What problems occur when humans intera interact with animals? And again, this sounds like a lot, but remember from last week, this is very easy. Um, once we jump into it, it'll be a little bit more clear. Let's look at our annotation key one more time so we can remember what uh, what type of symbols we're going to use as we read. Every time we find a major point, we're going to underline. Anytime we find a keyword or phrase that's confusing to us or that we might not know, we're going to circle. Um, anytime we have a question, we're going to write in the margins, which usually just means on the right side, on the left side or below. And we'll also put our margin notes there um, in the same, you know, same places we put the questions, right? Um, uh, of course, I have an example of all these things, so if you forget, don't worry. You'll see as soon as I scroll back up, you'll see that my text is already marked up. Okay. Before we even get into this really quickly, let's go back to these day one questions. On day one, I asked you to write down four things that you wanted to know. And again, your questions are going to be different than my questions. Uh, at the end of our reading, we're going to come back and answer these day one questions that we did right here at the top of our text, okay? Let's go ahead and begin reading now. I'm going to stop and explain to you why I underlined, circled, or wrote a margin note as I'm reading. Uh, and then after that, for the second text, it's going to be your turn to do the exact same thing that I did. Okay. Human changes to the environment. This text is adapted from an original work of the Core Knowledge Foundation. Every plant and animal in a natural ecosystem depends on other plants or animals for its survival. For example, a butterfly depends on a flower's nectar for food. At the same time, a flower depends on butterflies and other insects to spread its pollen. So here, as I find a major point, what I did is I underlined it. And this major point's in the first sentence. We're going to find that often, but not always. So my major point that I marked here, or what's really important to me, as I read, was every plant and animal in a natural ecosystem depends on other plants or animals for its survival. Okay? Very important point. I also circled this word nectar. We talked about the flowers nectar. Now, it doesn't tell us directly what it is, but we know it's something that's coming from a flower. We're talking about um, something that the, that the insects can eat as well. So that's a, a big clue about what the flower's nectar is. And sometimes we'll find that it might not give us an exact definition, but we can get close. Thousands of years ago, early humans were like all other living things in nature. They were just another part of the natural food chain. They hunted animals and gathered plants for food. They made shelters and clothing using the materials in their environment. Most importantly, they used only what they needed for basic survival. So here, the major point that I saw was they were just another part of the natural food chain. That's a major point here. It's showing us that when humans lived in the forest and jungles, not only did they hunt for food, but um, they might even have been prey or food for other animals if they were a part of a food chain, right? 
And that actually is my question that I wrote here uh, underneath this paragraph. If humans were a part of the food chain, where they pray for other animals? We're going to read and we're going to see if we can find the answer to that question. And sometimes we may not. If we don't find the answer, that's okay. But it's still something that I was wondering as I was reading. Let's keep going to paragraph three. However, humans also had the ability to create and use technology. At first, they used simple technology, like tools made of stone and wood. These tools made it easier to hunt, build, and do other things for survival. So immediately I highlighted, or I should say circled this word, technology. When I think of technology, I think of computers, I think of cell phones, but I'm thinking to myself also, they couldn't have had cell phones <laughs> back thousands of years ago, even hundreds of years ago, right? So I, when I was reading, I was looking for another definition of this word technology. Let's see if I can find it in the next sentence. At first, they used simple technology like tools made of stone and wood. Okay. So essentially, what it's saying here is that they're considering tools a form of technology as well. And I underlined these tools made it easier to hunt, build, and do other things for their survival. So they're using these tools, also called technology, to help them to survive, right? And again, I want to redirect you to the picture below where we can see early humans using tools to hunt an animal. Over time, technology improved. Humans learned to create and use machines. Instead of hunting animals, they learned to raise animals like cows and chickens for food. Instead of gathering nuts, berries, and roots, they learned to grow their own crops. In other words, humans learned to change and control some parts of nature to meet their needs. So there were two very, actually, I'm sorry, three sentences that had important points uh, in this paragraph. So my first one is, over time, technology improved. Uh, then you can't see it, but there's a period here, and the next sentence begins, humans learn to create and use machines. Both of these are key, point, key, mm, <laughs> key points that show me that technology has improved all the way up to the point where they started using machines. So this is showing me that also uh, we're, we're getting into modern times where technology has advanced to, you know, electronic technology that we have now, like cell phones, other types of machines, as you'll see in the picture below in a second. Um, and they use these machines to help them to survive, right? Another key point that I saw was at the last sentence. It says, in other words, humans learn to change and control some parts of nature to meet their needs. So in other words, uh, we're now, instead of depending on nature for our for survival by hunting and gathering food, we're now able to manipulate nature when and where we want it to live easier. And that's pretty much how we live today. We will never have to hunt or farm for food, or I should say most people will not have to do that. Uh, we can just go to the supermarket, right? So this is showing us that technology made life easier for humans, and that's what I wrote in my margin notes. New technology made life easier for humans. So I tried to clarify the information that I learned in the paragraph, and I wrote it as a sentence in my margin note. With technology, humans were able to change the environment. The land in this picture may have been a forest or natural grassland. Now, instead, it is a wheat field. Insects and other organisms still live in the soil and feed on the wheat plant. However, this is not what you might call a natural field. Humans planted the seeds in this field, and humans decide when to harvest the crops to make food. So two major points here. The first and last sentence. The first sentence is, with technology, humans were able to change the environment. Pretty much reiterating that point we made earlier, that humans are able to use nature now, more so how they want it, and they don't have to depend on nature as it used to be, right? And the last sentence says, humans planted the seeds in this field, and humans decide when to harvest the crops to make food. So not only do we plant the, the seeds there, but we can actually decide that we want to harvest them, which means pick them today, tomorrow, next week, when would we like to eat? Um, and that's something that we could not have done if it was a natural field. We'd have to wait for uh, 
the the crops to grow and to bloom or harvest in their own time, right? Um, some key words that I saw here were natural grasslands. Um, so think about the word natural, something that occurs in nature, right? And grassland, land that has grass. So we're thinking like where grass naturally occurs, like a forest, for example. So the land in this picture may have been a forest or a natural grassland. They're saying that this forest without human uh, intervention would have basically have been, you know, a place where animals live. There would have been lots of grass, etc. But instead, uh, it's, it's a wheat field now. And we did that to make our own lives easier. Another key word I have here is organisms. It says insects and other organisms still live in the soil and feed on the wheat plants. I circled organisms here because I was curious as to what it is. I can find out by reading the sentence though, right? Insects and other organisms. So I know that an organism is either an insect or another type of living creature. So I'm glad that they gave us uh, a clue as to what an organism was because it may be an unfamiliar word to many of us. Um, and I also have a question and a statement, clarifying statement here below. My question was, what types of insects live in this wheat field shown in the photograph? My statement was, humans change forests into farms where we plant our food. So that's just a clarifying statement helping me to uh, solidify and consolidate all the information I learned in this paragraph. The land beneath any town or city was once a natural ecosystem. Then humans came along and used technology to change the natural environment. There are some trees, grass, and flowers in a city, but they are only there because people want them there. Some animals, like squirrels and birds, also live in cities alongside humans, but these creatures had to learn to survive in an environment created by humans. Now, with all our cities and technology, it is sometimes easy for us to forget about nature and ecosystems. It is easy for us to think of nature as something we can visit, but not something we are really a part of. Two really big points here. Um, the first, that the land beneath any town or city uh, was used to be a forest, used to be a natural ecosystem, here in the first sentence. Um, this is just showing us again that without human intervention, things might look very differently. Even the next sentence, then humans came along and used technology to change the natural environment. This is again showing us that uh, because humans have or because we want to live easier, we don't want to have to forage for food or hunt for animals, etc. We change the environment to make our own lives easier. But as we can see um, through our continued reading, it kind of makes this life harder for animals, right? Because we've created these cities. Um, a word I circle was creatures, but these creatures had to learn to survive in an environment created by humans. Again, I'm just using context clues, so even if I don't know what the word creature means, I'm thinking about something that has to live in an environment created by humans. Let's go back to the previous sentence and see what types of creatures they're talking about. Some animals like squirrels and birds also live in cities alongside humans, but these creatures had to learn to survive in, in an environment created by humans. So the creatures they're referring to are the squirrels and birds and other types of animals there. And again, it's showing us that these, these animals have to, had to adapt to their new environment, which is the city. The last sentence I underlined is, it is easy for us to think of nature as something we can visit, but not something we really are a part of. Um, we are really a part of. I underlined this because it struck out to me something that's very true. It's not just something that's true inside the paragraph, but it's something that was important to me as I was reading. And sometimes you'll read and you'll find things like that where it's like, wow, this really hit home for me. How much do I really think of myself as part of a natural ecosystem rather than as part of a city or as part of a family, as part of a school? Uh, they're very different concepts. Finally, I have a margin note. Does humans have built cities where animals and insects used to live? Oh, made a small mistake there. Go to where? So there we go. Humans have built cities where animals and insects used to live. Um, again, just reiterating the fact that we've changed this environment so much from animals and other insects. Okay. 
All right, guys, so I did the first text. It's now your turn to do the second text. Of course, I'm going to be here to guide you. And I want to give you the key one more time that you're going to be using. Anytime you find a major point, you're going to underline it. Anytime you find a word that may be confusing, that's a keyword, you're going to circle it. Uh, anytime you have a question, we'll write it beneath the paragraph, on the side of the paragraph. We call that the margin notes, uh, or I'm sorry, in the margins. And finally, a margin note would be when you have a clarifying statement or a statement about what you just read. Really quickly, I, I want to say one more time that yours may not be exactly like mine. You may find different things important. Hopefully, we'll have some similar ideas. It should be close, but it might be slightly different. Um, you might have different questions than I have, and you might know many of the words there, so you may not circle as many words as I circle. Um, this is really just a strategy that's going to help you with your reading. So I want you to do what feels comfortable for you and what feels right for you and not think about what your teacher wants you to do in this particular case, all right? or what questions your teacher may have. This is all a strategy to help you with your individual reading. That being said, let's go ahead and let's move on. This is the missing links. Again, I'm going to read, but after I read a paragraph, I will stop. And I'll let you get a chance to underline, circle, question, or write something in the margin notes. Meet the most endangered wildcat in the world, Diberian lynx. A hundred years ago, thousands of these lynxes roamed Spain and nearby Portugal, part of the region that makes up Liberia. But by the 1990s, they were missing from almost the entire area. Fewer than 100 remained in the wild. Okay, guys, what do you want to underline here? What's a major point in this paragraph? What do you want to circle? Are there any keywords? And do you have any questions? Let's go ahead and let's write those right now. Okay, guys, so a major point here was uh, these last two sentences, but by the 1990s, they were missing from almost the entire area. Fewer than 100 remained in the wild. These, are, these two sentences are important because it shows us that the lynx has almost gone in extinct there. So I think those would be something great to underline as major points. Let's keep going. There are a number of reasons Iberian lynxes have become so rare. One reason is that some of the land they need has been taken for farming and building. Another is that roads cut through the lynx's habitat, so the cats are sometimes hit by cars. Also, people illegally kill them. Um, as we read this paragraph, we could probably tell immediately that this is giving this paragraph gives us reasons why, uh, how the links has disappeared. I'm sorry, why the links has disappeared. Go ahead and underline uh, some of the reasons why the links has disappeared in this sentence. Also, if you have any words that you would like to circle that are unfamiliar to you, you may do that. And you may also write a margin note uh, or a question uh, that you have based on this paragraph. So almost any sentence really would have worked um, because it's all about why the links are disappearing. One sentence you could have used was the last one. Also, people illegally kill them. Um, that gives me a reason of why the links have started to disappear. Let's go to paragraph three. But one of the biggest reasons the links are disappearing has to do with their diet. These cats are, I'm sorry, these cats eat rabbits and little else. Unfortunately, in the last 60 years, rabbits in lynx areas have been almost wiped out by disease and hunting. As the rabbits disappear, the lynxes have too. So this is really as much a story about missing rabbits as it is about missing lynxes. 
To save the lynxes, scientists have to help the rabbits. Go ahead again and underline any major points, circle any keywords, and write questions that you may have in the margin. Or statements you may have in the margin. So as we learn from reading this paragraph, it gives us the major reason why lynxes are disappearing. Um, one sentence you could have underlined is, as the rabbits disappeared, the lynxes have two. But there were, there were actually a few sentences that show that same idea. So any sentence that shows me that there's a connection between these rabbits disappearing and the lynxes disappearing would have been fine. Let's go to paragraph four. To help the lynxes, scientists came up with a plan to bring back the rabbits. They created rabbitats. The word is a cross between habitat. I'm sorry. <laughs> time. The word is a cross between rabbit and habitats. And the rabbitats uh, are artificial. I don't know what's going on with me today. One more time. I'm promise I'm going to get it correctly this time. In the rabbitats are artificial barrels, tubes that go underground in the way that real rabbits do. Again, I want you to go ahead and underline, circle, write a question or a margin note for this paragraph. There really wasn't that much to choose from this paragraph. You could have underlined the first sentence to help the links as scientists came up with a plan to bring back the rabbits. Um, but the last sentence also would work as well. I'll leave it up to your discretion about which one you would like to underline. And don't forget uh, to circle any words that might be unfamiliar to you. So Rabbitat might be one. It gives us a definition for Rabbitat right after it says the word. But if you were unsure as you were reading, that might be a good word to circle. The scientists put fences around big areas containing the rabbits. The fences were high enough to keep out rabbit predators such as foxes, mongooses, and boars. But lynxes could easily jump over them. That meant they wouldn't have to compete with other predators for food. Go ahead and underline, circle, write a question or a statement in the margin notes for this paragraph. If I'm ever moving too fast, feel free to pause the video, write, and then continue after you're done. So a sentence that was very, very important here to me is that that meant they wouldn't have to compete with other predators for food. I think that sentence works well with this, the first sentence as well. The scientists put fences, uh, big fen mm, scientists put fences around big areas containing the rabbits. Those two sentences together show me that uh, scientists put this fence around the rabbits in the rabbit hat and it allowed it, it allowed lynxes to only to be the only ones that are, are able to hunt the rabbits inside the fence. Finally, the scientists released more than 1,000 rabbits into the rabbit hats. The rabbits had been given shots to protect them from disease. With fewer predators and with ready-made burrows to live in, the rabbits would be able to start breeding right away. Go ahead and underline, circle, or write a question or a statement in the margin note. I probably would have underlined the first sentence here. Finally, the scientists released more than 1,000 rabbits into the rabbit hats. Uh, this shows me that um, now there were plenty of rabbits that uh, will begin this process of bringing the lynx back. Operation Lynx. 
Putting back the rabbits was one part of the puzzle. Putting back the lynxes was another. When scientists first saw how endangered the Iberian lynx had become, they took some wild lynxes and brought them to breeding centers. There, the animals could mate and have babies in safety. The goal was to have more lynxes to release back into the wild. Over the years, the lynxes in the breeding centers multiplied. Finally, it was time to release some of them. Let's go ahead and look at paragraphs 7, 8, and 9. They're all pretty connected, so I did them together. Please underline any major ideas there. Circle any keywords that were confusing for you and write any questions or statements you had in the margin notes. So the big ideas here for me were in paragraph 8, the first sentence, when scientists first saw how endangered the Iberian lynx had become, they took some wild lynxes and brought them to breeding centers. And also the first sentence of the paragraph 9, which says, over the years, the lynxes and the breeding centers multiplied. Um, these two sentences show me that scientists brought them in and they were successful and there ended up being a lot more lynxes than they had started out with. Almost done, guys. Toward the bottom. Let's keep going. Making links is welcome. Before that could happen, scientists needed to work with landowners to stop them from killing lynxes that became that came onto their properties. The landowners wanted to hunt the rabbits for themselves and didn't want the lynxes to get them first. Now, scientists have been able to convince many landowners to allow lynxes to live on their land. The scientists explain to landowners that lynxes keep other rabbit predators out of their territory. That means there can still be plenty of rabbits for both the lynxes and the hunters. Once many landowners had agreed, the lynxes were released. Go ahead and circle any keywords, underline any major points, and add any questions or statements to the margin notes. So here, the first sentence of paragraph 10 and the last sentence of paragraph 10 show the major ideas. The first sentence says, but before that could happen, scientists needed to work with landowners to stop them from killing the lynxes that came into their properties. And the last sentence says, once many landowners had agreed, the lynxes were released. This basically shows me that um, they need to convince people not to kill lynx. And finally, once they had done that, they started putting the lynx back into the wild. Hope for the future. The lynxes have adapted well to their new home and are even having lots of babies. In addition to releasing captive bred lynxes, scientists also moved some wild lynxes to new areas where there hadn't been any in a long time. After all these efforts to res rescue the Liberian, Iberian lynx, there is some good news. In the last 10 years, the lynx population has tripled. Today, more than 300 lynx roam free. There is still a long way to go. But the hope is that these special cats are on the road to recovery. Let's go ahead and underline the major points here, circle the unfamiliar words, and write questions or statements in the margin that we had based on our reading. So here the major point is that there is hope for the lynx and that's pretty well captured um, in the last two sentences of paragraph 12. Today more than 300 lynx is run free. There is still a long way to go but the hope is that these special cats are on the road to recovery. 
Those are not the only major points, but those are some of the major points. You may have different underlines for these particular two paragraphs, and that's okay. And you may have different words uh, circled as well, and that's also okay. We're almost done, guys, but we're not quite finished. Remember at the beginning of the lesson, I said that we were going to go ahead and answer our questions from day one. So let's scroll back up. So remember, my questions are not going to be the same as your questions. You ask your own questions on day one about what you wanted to know, and you're going to be answering your own questions. I'm going to answer my own questions as an example, but I really would like for you to have your questions from day one for this portion of the lesson. My Q1 asks, do humans hurt animals in their habitats? Unfortunately, yes. We learned that humans uh, hunt animals for food and other reasons. Um, we learned about this with the lynx as well. That was one, one reason, not the major reason, but one reason why the lynx began to disappear is that people were illegally hunting them. My question two asks, how do humans affect habitats? Actually, that says habits. <laughs> Let's try this one more time. Habitats. There we go. Habitats. Um, humans affect habitats in many ways. Oftentimes, we cut down trees to build cities and farmland. Um, and that is unfortunate, as we learned, because, again, um, it hurts animals sometimes, unfortunately. So humans sometimes cut down trees and to build cities. Okay, my question three asks, have humans ever helped animals in their habitat? Yes, we, we have. We learned about how we helped the Iberian lynx. Um, so, sometimes humans help animals uh, populate which means that sometimes humans help animals to have more animals, have more animal babies, and ultimately refill uh, the population or uh, further the species, right? Question four, how have animals adapted to human activity? Uh, they have. We learned that squirrels and birds have learned to adapt uh, and live in cities with humans. Oh, this is not ideal. Um, it is what they have had to do to survive. So we've learned that some animals have learned oops, to live in cities. Okay, with that we are done with our lesson. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to your teacher. That would be myself, Ms. Deal, or Ms. Alexander for further help. I uh, hope everyone's staying safe and staying, uh, <laughs> I want to say, entertained with these lessons. I uh, look forward to seeing you guys soon.